Jiju Krishnamurti, 1895-1896 February 17, 1986, was a speaker and writer on philosophical and spiritual subjects. In his early life he was groomed to be the New World Teacher, but later rejected this mantle and disbanded the organization behind it. His subject matter included psychological revolution, the nature of mind, meditation, inquiry, human relationships, and bringing about radical change in society. He constantly stressed the need for a revolution in the psyche of every human being, and emphasized that such revolution cannot be brought about by any external entity, be it religious, political, or social. Krishnamurti was born into a Telugu Brahmin family in India, British India. In early adolescence, he had a chance encounter with prominent occultist and theosophist Charles Webster Leadbeater in the grounds of the Theosophical Society headquarters at ADR in Madras. He was subsequently raised under the tutelage of Annie Besant and Leadbeater, leaders of the society, at the time, who believed him to be a vehicle for an expected world teacher. As a young man, he disavowed this idea and dissolved the Order of the Star an organization that had been established to support it. He claimed allegiance to no nationality, caste, religion, or philosophy, and spent the rest of his life traveling the world, speaking to large and small groups and individuals. He wrote many books, among them The First and Last Freedom, The Only Revolution, and Krishnamurti's Notebook. Many of his talks and discussions have been published. His last public talk was in Madras, India, in January 1986, a month before his death at his home in Ojai, California. His supporters, working through non-profit foundations in India, Great Britain, and the United States, oversee several independent schools based on his views on education. They continue to transcribe and distribute his thousands of talks, group, and individual discussions, and writings by use of a variety of media formats and languages. Family Background and Childhood The date of birth of Jiju Krishnamurti is a matter of dispute. Lutians determines it to be May 12, 1895 but Christine Williams notes the unreliability of birth registrations in that period, and that statements claiming dates ranging from May 4, 1895 to May 25, 1896 exist. She uses calculations based on a published horoscope to derive a date of May 11, 1895, but retains a measure of skepticism about it. His birthplace was the small town of Madanapal in Madras Presidency, modern-day Chitar district in Andhra Pradesh. He came from a family of pious Telugu-speaking Hindu Brahmins, and his father, Jajun Arayaniya, was employed as an official of the British colonial administration. Krishnamurti was fond of his mother Sonia Vama, who died when he was ten. His parents had a total of eleven children, of whom six survived childhood. In 1903, the family settled in Kutape, where Krishnamurti had contracted malaria during a previous stay. He would suffer recurrent bouts of the disease over many years. A sensitive and sickly child, vague and dreamy, he was often taken to be mentally retarded, and was beaten regularly at school by his teachers, and at home by his father. In memoirs written when he was 18 years old, Krishnamurti described psychic experiences, such as seeing his sister, who had died in 1904, and his late mother. During his childhood he developed a bond with nature that was to stay with him for the rest of his life. Krishnamurti's father retired at the end of 1907, and, being of limited means, sought employment at the headquarters of the Theosophical Society at ADR. In addition to being a Brahmin, Narayaniya had been a theosophist since 1882. He was eventually hired by the society as a clerk, moving there with his family in January 1909. Narayaniya and his sons were at first assigned to live in a small cottage that lacked adequate sanitation and which was located just outside the society's compound. Krishnamurti and his brothers were soon undernourished and infested with lice discovered. In April 1909, Krishnamurti first met Charles Webster Leadbeater, who claimed clairvoyance. 
Leadbeater had noticed Krishnamurti on the society's beach on the ADR River and was amazed by the most wonderful aura he had ever seen, without a particle of selfishness, in it a byerness would, an adjutant of Leadbeater's, at the time, who helped Krishnamurti with his homework, he was considered particularly dim-witted. Leadbeater was convinced that the boy would become a spiritual teacher and a great orator, the likely vehicle for the Lord Maitreya and theosophical doctrine, an advanced spiritual entity periodically appearing on earth as a world teacher to guide the evolution of humankind. In her biography of Krishnamurti, Pupal Jayakar quotes him speaking of that period in his life some 75 years later, the boy had always said, I will do whatever you want. There was an element of subservience, obedience. The boy was vague, uncertain, woolly, he didn't seem to care what was happening. He was like a vessel with a large hole in it, whatever was put in, went through, nothing remained. Following his discovery, Krishnamurti was nurtured by the Theosophical Society in ADR. Leadbeater and a small number of trusted associates undertook the task of educating, protecting, and generally preparing Krishnamurti as the vehicle of the expected world teacher. Krishnamurti, often later called Krishnaji, and his younger brother Nityananda Nitya were privately tutored at the Theosophical Compound in Madras and later exposed to a comparatively opulent life among a segment of European high society as they continued their education abroad. Despite his history of problems with schoolwork and concerns about his capacities and physical condition, the 14-year-old Krishnamurti was able to speak and write competently in English within six months. Lutian says that later in life Krishnamurti came to view his discovery as a life-saving event. Often, he was asked in later life what he thought would have happened to him if he had not been discovered by Lee Beater. He would unhesitatingly reply, I would have died. During this time, Krishnamurti had developed a strong bond with Annie Besant and came to view her as a surrogate mother. His father, who had initially assented to Besant's legal guardianship of Krishnamurti, was pushed into the background by the swirl of attention around his son. In 1912 he sued Besant in order to annul the guardianship agreement. After a protracted legal battle, Besant took custody of Krishnamurti and Nitya. As a result of this separation from family and home, Krishnamurti and his brother, whose relationship had always been very close, became more dependent on each other and in the following years often traveled together. In 1911, the Theosophical Society established the Order of the Star in the East, O's, to prepare the world for the expected appearance of the world teacher. Krishnamurti was named as its head, with senior theosophists assigned various other positions. Membership was open to anybody who accepted the doctrine of the coming of the world teacher. Controversy erupted soon after, both within the Theosophical Society and without, in Hindu circles and the Indian press B. Growing up Mary Lutians, a biographer and friend of Krishnamurti, says that there was a time when he believed that he was to become the world teacher after correct spiritual and secular guidance and education. Another biographer describes the daily program imposed on him by Lee Beater and his associates, which included rigorous exercise and sports, tutoring in a variety of school subjects, theosophical and religious lessons, yoga and meditation, as well as instruction in proper hygiene and in the ways of British society and culture. At the same time, Leadbeater assumed the role of guide in a parallel, mystical instruction of Krishnamurti. The existence and progress of this instruction was at the time known only to a select few. While he showed a natural aptitude in sports, Krishnamurti always had problems with formal schooling and was not academically inclined. He eventually gave up university education after several attempts at admission. He did take to foreign languages, in time speaking several with some fluency. His public image, cultivated by the Theosophists, was to be characterized by a well-polished exterior, a sobriety of purpose, a cosmopolitan outlook, and an otherworldly, almost beatific detachment in his demeanor. Demonstrably, all of these can be said to have characterized Krishnamurti's public image to the end of his life.
It was apparently clear early on that he possessed an innate personal magnetism, not of a warm physical variety, but nonetheless emotive in its austerity, and inclined to inspire veneration. However, as he was growing up, Krishnamurti showed signs of adolescent rebellion and emotional instability, chafing at the regimen imposed on him, visibly uncomfortable with the publicity surrounding him, and occasionally expressing doubts about the future prescribed for him. See Krishnamurti in England in 1911, with his brother Nitya, and the theosophist Sani Besant and George Arendale. Krishnamurti and Nitya were taken to England in April 1911. During this trip Krishnamurti gave his first public speech to members of the O's in London. His first writings had also started to appear, published in booklets by the Theosophical Society and in Theosophical and O's affiliated magazines. Between 1911 and the start of World War I in 1914, the brothers visited several other European countries, always accompanied by theosophist chaperones. Meanwhile Krishnamurti had for the first time acquired a measure of personal financial independence thanks to a wealthy benefactress. After the war, Krishnamurti embarked on a series of lectures, meetings, and discussions around the world related to his duties as the head of the O's, accompanied by Nitya, by then the organizing secretary of the order. Krishnamurti also continued writing. The content of his talks and writings revolved around the work of the order and of its members in preparation for the coming. He was described, initially, as a halting, hesitant, and repetitive speaker, but his delivery and confidence improved, and he gradually took command of the meetings. He also fell in love, in 1921, with Helen Noth, a 17-year-old American, whose family was associated with the Theosophists. The experience was tempered by the realization that his work and expected life mission precluded what would otherwise be considered normal relationships, and by the mid-1920s the two of them had drifted apart. Life-altering Experiences in 1922 Krishnamurti and Nitya traveled from Sydney to California. While in California, they stayed at a cottage in the Ojai Valley. It was thought that the area's climate would be beneficial to Nitya, who had been diagnosed with tuberculosis. Nitya's ailing health would become a concern for Krishnamurti. At Ojai they met Rosalind Williams, a young American, who became close to them both, and who was later to have a significant role in Krishnamurti's life. For the first time the brothers were without immediate supervision by their Theosophical Society minders. They found the valley to be very agreeable. Eventually a trust, formed by supporters, purchased a cottage and surrounding property there for them. This became Krishnamurti's official place of residence. It was at Ohio in August and September 1922 that Krishnamurti went through an intense, life-changing experience. This has been variously characterized as a spiritual awakening, a psychological transformation, and a physical conditioning. The initial events happened in two distinct phases, first a three-day spiritual experience followed two weeks later, by a longer-lasting condition that Krishnamurti and those around him would refer to as the process, this condition would recur at frequent intervals and with varying intensity until his death. According to witnesses, it started on August 17, 1922, with Krishnamurti complaining of sharp pain at the nape of his neck. Over the next two days, the symptoms worsened with increasing pain and sensitivity, a loss of appetite and occasional delirious ramblings. He seemed to lapse into unconsciousness, but later recounted that he was very much aware of his surroundings, and that while in that state had an experience of mystical union. The following day the symptoms and the experience intensified, climaxing with a sense of immense peace. Following and apparently related to these events, the condition which came to be known as the process started to affect him in September and October of that year as a regular, almost nightly occurrence. Later, the process would resume intermittently with varying degrees of pain, 
physical discomfort and sensitivity, occasionally a lapse into a childlike state, and sometimes an apparent fading out of consciousness explained as either his body giving into pain, or, as him going off D. These experiences were accompanied, or followed, by what was interchangeably described as, the benediction, the immensity, the sacredness, the vastness, and, most often, the otherness, or the other. It was a state distinct from the process. According to Lutians, it is evident from his notebook, that this experience of otherness was with him almost continuously during his life, and gave him a sense of being protected. Krishnamurti describes it in his notebook as typically following an acute experience of the process, for example, on awakening the next day. Woke up early with that strong feeling of otherness, of another world, that is beyond all thought, there is a heightening of sensitivity. Sensitivity, not only to beauty, but also to all other things. The blade of grass was astonishingly green, that one blade of grass contained the whole spectrum of color, it was intense, dazzling. And such a small thing, so easy to destroy. This experience of the otherness would be present with him during daily events. It is strange how during one or two interviews that strength, that power filled the room. It seemed to be in one's eyes and breath. It comes into being, suddenly, and most unexpectedly, with a force and intensity, that is quite overpowering, and at other times it's there, quietly, and serenely. But it's there, whether one wants it, or not. There is no possibility of getting used to it for it has never been, nor will it ever be. Since the initial occurrences of 1922, several explanations have been proposed for this experience of Krishnamurti Zealid Beater, and other theosophists expected the vehicle to have certain paranormal experiences, but were nevertheless mystified by these developments. During Krishnamurti's later years the nature and provenance of the continuing process often came up as a subject in private discussions between himself and associates, these discussions shed some light on the subject but were ultimately inconclusive. Whatever the case, the process, and the inability of Lee Beater, to explain it satisfactorily, if at all, has other consequences according to biographer Roland Vanen. The process at Ojai, whatever its cause or validity, was a cataclysmic milestone for Krishna. Up until this time his spiritual progress, checkered though it might have been, had been planned with solemn deliberation by Theosophy's grandees. Something new had now occurred for which Krishna's training had not entirely prepared him. A burden was lifted from his conscience, and he took his first step towards becoming an individual. In terms of his future role as a teacher, the process was his bedrock. It had come to him alone, and had not been planted in him by his mentors, it provided Krishna with the soil in which his newfound spirit of confidence and independence could take root. As news of these mystical experiences spread, rumors concerning the messianic status of Krishnamurti reached fever pitch, as the 1925 Theosophical Society Convention was planned, on the 50th anniversary of its founding. There were expectations of significant happenings. Paralleling the increasing adulation was Krishnamurti's growing discomfort with it. In related developments, prominent theosophists and their factions within the society were trying to position themselves favorably relative to the coming, which was widely rumored to be approaching. Extraordinary pronouncements of spiritual advancement were made by various parties, disputed by others, and the internal theosophical politics further alienated Krishnamurti. Nitya's persistent health problems had periodically resurfaced throughout this time. On November 13, 1925, at age 27, he died in Ojai from complications of influenza and tuberculosis. Despite Nitya's poor health, his death was unexpected, and it fundamentally shook Krishnamurti's belief in theosophy and in the leaders of the Theosophical Society. He had received their assurances regarding Nitya's health and had come to believe that Nitya was essential for his life mission, and therefore he would not be allowed to die, a belief shared by Annie Besant and Krishnamurti circle. Jayakor wrote that his belief in the masters, and the hierarchy had undergone a total revolution. Moreover, Nitya had been the last surviving link to his family and childhood. The only person to whom he could talk openly, his best friend and companion. 
according to eyewitness accounts, the news broke him completely. But twelve days after Nitya's death he was immensely quiet, radiant, and free of all sentiment and emotion there was not a shadow to show what he had been through. Break with the Past Over the next few years, Krishnamurti's new vision and consciousness continued to develop. New concepts appeared in his talks, discussions, and correspondence, together with an evolving vocabulary that was progressively free of theosophical terminology. His new direction reached a climax in 1929, when he rebuffed attempts by Elite Beater and Besant to continue with the Order of the Star. Krishnamurti dissolved the order during the annual Star Camp at Amman, the Netherlands, on August 3, 1929. He stated that he had made his decision after careful consideration during the previous two years, and that I maintain that truth is a pathless land and you cannot approach it by any path whatsoever, by any religion, by any sect. That is my point of view, and I adhere to that absolutely and unconditionally. Truth, being limitless, unconditioned, unapproachable by any path whatsoever, cannot be organized, nor should any organization be formed to lead or coerce people along a particular path. This is no magnificent deed, because I do not want followers, and I mean this. The moment you follow someone you cease to follow truth. I am not concerned whether you pay attention to what I say, or not. I want to do a certain thing in the world, and I am going to do it with unwavering concentration. I am concerning myself with only one essential thing, to set man free. I desire to free him from all cages, from all fears, and not to found religions, new sects, nor to establish new theories, and new philosophies. Following the dissolution prominent the Asifists turned against Krishnamurti, including Leibeter, who is said to have stated, the coming had gone wrong. Krishnamurti had announced all organized belief, the notion of gurus, and the whole teacher-follower relationship, vowing instead to work in setting people absolutely, unconditionally free. There is no record of him explicitly denying he was the world teacher. Whenever he was asked to clarify his position, he either asserted that the matter was irrelevant, or gave answers that, as he stated, were purposely vague. In reflection of the ongoing changes in his outlook, he had started doing so before the dissolution of the Order of the Star. The subtlety of the new distinctions on the world teacher issue was lost on many of his admirers, who were already bewildered or distraught because of the changes in Krishnamurti's outlook, vocabulary, and pronouncements among them Besant and Mary Ludian's mother Emily, who had a very close relationship with him. He soon disassociated himself from the Theosophical Society and its teachings and practices, F, yet he remained on cordial terms with some of its members and ex-members throughout his life. Krishnamurti would often refer to the totality of his work as the teachings and not as my teachings. Krishnamurti resigned from the various trusts and other organizations that were affiliated with the defunct Order of the Star, including the Theosophical Society. He returned the money and properties donated to the Order, among them a castle in the Netherlands, and 5,000 acres, 20 km2, of land, to their donors. He spent the rest of his life holding dialogues and giving public talks around the world on the nature of belief, truth, sorrow, freedom, death, and the quest for a spiritually fulfilled life. He accepted neither followers nor worshippers, regarding the relationship between disciple and guru as encouraging dependency and exploitation. He accepted gifts and financial support freely offered to him by people inspired by his work, and continued with lecture tours and the publication of books and talk transcripts for more than half a century. Middle Years From 1930 through 1944 Krishnamurti engaged in speaking tours and in the issue of publications under the auspice of the Star Publishing Trust SPT, which he had founded with De Sekacharya Rajagopal, a close associate and friend from the Order of the Star Geo High was the base of operations for the new enterprise, where Krishnamurti, Rajagopal, and Rosalind Williams, who had married Rajagopal in 1927, resided in the house known as Arya Vihara, meaning realm of the Arya Sai, those noble by righteousness in Sanskrit.
The business and organizational aspects of the SPT were administered chiefly by D. Rajagopal, as Krishnamurti devoted his time to speaking and meditation. The Rajagopal's marriage was not a happy one, and the two became physically estranged after the 1931 birth of their daughter, Radha. In the relative seclusion of Aryavihara, Krishnamurti's close friendship with Rosalind deepened into a love affair which was not made public until 1991 period H.I. During the 1930s, Krishnamurti spoke in Europe, Latin America, India, Australia, and the United States. In 1938, he met Aldous Huxley. The two began a close friendship which endured for many years. They held common concerns about the imminent conflict in Europe which they viewed as the outcome of the pernicious influence of nationalism. Krishnamurti's stance on World War II was often construed as pacifism and even subversion during a time of patriotic fervor in the United States, and for a time he came under the surveillance of the FBI. He did not speak publicly for a period of about four years between 1940 and 1944. During this time he lived and worked at Harry of Ahara, which during the war operated as a largely self-sustaining farm, with its surplus goods donated for relief efforts in Europe. Of the years spent in Ohio during the war, he later said, I think it was a period of no challenge, no demand, no outgoing. I think it was a kind of everything held in, and when I left Ohio it all burst. Krishnamurti broke the hiatus from public speaking in May 1944 with a series of talks in Ohio. These talks and subsequent material were published by Krishnamurti Writings Inc. KWINC, the successor organization to the Star Publishing Trust. This was to be the new central Krishnamurti-related entity worldwide, whose sole purpose was the dissemination of the teaching. He had remained in contact with associates from India, and in the autumn of 1947 embarked upon a speaking tour there, attracting a new following of young intellectuals. J. It was on this trip that he first encountered the Maida sisters, Pupal and Nandini, who became lifelong associates and confidants. The sisters also attended to Krishnamurti throughout a 1948 recurrence of the process in Uttakamand. When in India after World War II, many prominent personalities came to meet with Krishnamurti, including Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. In his meetings with Nehru, Krishnamurti elaborated at length on the teachings, saying in one instance, understanding of the self only arises in relationship, in watching yourself in relationship to people, ideas, and things, to trees, the earth, and the world around you and within you. Relationship is the mirror in which the self is revealed. Without self-knowledge there is no basis for right thought and action. Nehru asked, how does one start? To which Krishnamurti replied, begin, where you are. Read every word, every phrase, every paragraph of the mind as it operates through thought. Later Years Krishnamurti continued speaking in public lectures, group discussions, and with concerned individuals around the world. In the early 1960s, he made the acquaintance of physicist David Bohm, whose philosophical and scientific concerns regarding the essence of the physical world and the psychological and sociological state of mankind found parallels in Krishnamurti's philosophy. The two men soon became close friends and started a common inquiry in the form of personal dialogues and occasionally in group discussions with other participants that continued periodically over nearly two decades K. Several of these discussions were published in the form of books or as parts of books and introduced a wider audience among scientists to Krishnamurti's ideas. Although Krishnamurti's philosophy delved into fields as diverse as religious studies, education, psychology, physics, and consciousness studies, he was not then, nor since, well known in academic circles. Nevertheless, Krishnamurti met and held discussions with several prominent scientists, including physicists Rudyard Capra and George Sudarshan, biologist Rupert Sheldrake psychiatrist David Shainbert, as well as psychotherapists representing various theoretical orientations. The long friendship between Bohm and Krishnamurti went through a rocky interval in later years, 
and, although they overcame their differences, and remained friends, until Krishnamurti's death, the relationship did not regain its previous intensity. L.M. In the 1970s, Krishnamurti met several times with an Indian Prime Minister in Dyer Gandhi, with whom he had far-ranging, and in some cases, very serious discussions. Jayakor considers his message in meetings with Indira Gandhi as a possible influence in the lifting of certain emergency measures Gandhi had imposed during periods of political turmoil. Meanwhile, Krishnamurti's once close relationship with the Rajagopals had deteriorated to the point where he took Dira Jagopal to court to recover donated property and funds as well as publication rights for his works, manuscripts and personal correspondence that were in Rajagopal's possession and the litigation and ensuing cross-complaints, which formally began in 1971, continued for many years. A substantial portion of materials and property was returned to Krishnamurti. During his lifetime, the parties to this case finally settled all other matters, in 1986, shortly after his death op. In 1984 and 1985 he spoke to an invited audience at the United Nations in New York, under the auspices of the Paysem and Terrorist Society chapter, at the Inn. In November 1985 he visited India, for the last time, holding a number of what came to be known as farewell talks and discussions between the and January 1986. These last talks included the fundamental questions he had been asking through the years, as well as newer concerns related to then recent advances in science and technology and their effect on humankind. Krishnamurti had commented to friends that he did not wish to invite death, but was not sure how long his body would last. He had already lost considerable weight, and once he could no longer talk, he would have no further purpose. In his final talk, on January 4, 1986, in Madras, he again invited the audience to examine with him the nature of inquiry, the effect of technology, the nature of life and meditation, and the nature of creation. Krishnamurti was also concerned about his legacy, about being unwittingly turned into some personage, whose teachings had been handed down to special individuals rather than the world at large. He did not want anybody to pose as an interpreter of the teaching 87 he warned his associates on several occasions that they were not to present themselves as spokesmen on his behalf or as his successors after his death. A few days before his death, in a final statement, he declared that nobody among either his associates or the general public has understood what had happened to him as the conduit of the teaching. Nor had they understood the teaching itself. He added that the immense energy operating in his lifetime would be gone with his death, again implying the impossibility of successors. However, he offered hope by stating that people could approach that energy and gain a measure of understanding. If they live the teachings. In prior discussions he had compared himself with Thomas Edison, implying that he did the hard work, and now all was needed by others was a flick of the switch. Krishnamurti died of pancreatic cancer on February 17, 1986, at the age of 90. His remains were cremated and scattered by friends and former associates in the three countries where he had spent most of his life, India, England, and the United States of America. Recurrent Themes Knowledge Krishnamurti constantly emphasized the right place of thought in daily life. But he also pointed out the dangers of thought when it becomes knowledge that acts as a calcified projection of the past. According to Krishnamurti, such action distorts our perception and full understanding of the world we live in, and more specifically, the relationships that define it. He saw knowledge as a necessary but mechanical function of the mind. The capacity of mind to record can present barriers, however, for example, hurtful words spoken in a relationship may become memories that influence actions. Thus knowledge can present a division in a relationship and may be destructive. The brain, trained as it is to record, provides safety and security and a sense of vitality. The recording creates an image of oneself, of loved ones, firm, politicians, priests, and of the ideal. 
If these images are fixed, one will always be getting hurt, always living in a pattern in which there is no freedom. But if one is able to listen to it completely without any reaction, then there is no center which records. Fear and Pleasure Fear and pleasure were lifelong themes in his public talks. Meditation Krishnamurti used the term meditation to mean something entirely different from the practice of any system or method to control the mind, or to consciously achieve a specific goal or state. He dealt with the subject of meditation in numerous public talks and discussions. Education Krishnamurti founded several schools around the world, which includes Rockwood Park School, his only international educational center. When asked, he enumerated the following. As his educational aims. Global outlook, a vision of the whole, as distinct from the part, there should never be a sectarian outlook, but always a holistic outlook free from all prejudice. Concern for man and the environment, humanity is part of nature, and if nature is not cared for, it will boomerang on man. Only the right education, and deep affection between people everywhere, will resolve many problems including the environmental challenges. Religious spirit, which includes the scientific temper, the religious mind is alone, not lonely. It is in communion with people and nature. The Krishnamurti Foundation established in 1928 by him and Annie Besant runs many schools in India and abroad. Criticism Helen Nearing, who had known Krishnamurti in the 1920s, said that Krishnamurti's attitudes were conditioned by privilege because he had been supported, even pampered, by devoted followers from the time of his discovery by the Theosophists. She also said that he was at such an elevated level that he was incapable of forming normal personal relationships. In 1991, Radharaja Pals loss. The daughter of estranged Krishnamurti associates Rosalind and a Sekacharya Rajagopal wrote of Krishnamurti's relationship with her parents, including a secret affair between Krishnamurti and Rosalind which lasted for many years. Page needed the public revelation was received with surprise and consternation by many and was also dealt with in a rebuttal volume of biography by Mary Lutians. Roland Vernon questions the ultimate impact of the revelations when compared to Krishnamurti's body of work as a whole. U.G. Krishnamurti, no relation, reported that the two had almost daily discussions for a while, which he asserted were not providing satisfactory answers to his questions. Finally, their meetings came to a halt. He described part of the final discussion. And then, towards the end, I insisted, come, on, is there anything behind the abstractions you are throwing at me? And that chap he said, you have no way of knowing it for yourself. Finish that was the end of our relationship, you see if I have no way of knowing it, you have no way of communicating it. What the hell are we doing? I've wasted seven years. Goodbye, I don't want to see you again. Then I walked out. Influence Krishnamurti attracted the interest of the mainstream religious establishment in India. He engaged in discussions with several well-known Hindu and Buddhist scholars and leaders, including the Dalai Lama Q. Several of these discussions were later published as chapters in various Krishnamurti books. Interest in Krishnamurti and his work has persisted in the years since his death. Many books, audio, video, and computer materials remain in print and are carried by major online and traditional retailers. The four official foundations continue to maintain archives, disseminate the teachings in an increasing number of languages, convert print to digital and other media, develop websites, sponsor television programs, and organize meetings and dialogues of interested persons around the world. According to communications and press releases, from the foundations, their mailing lists and individuals' inquiries continue to grow, 